Welcome to us at AgHook. My name is Hannah Pickwick and I'm the executive assistant here. I'm happy to welcome you to our celebrations for Ukrainian Independence Day on August 24th. In celebration, we have Marnie Howlett giving an online lecture. Take it away, Marnie. Hello, everyone. My name is Marnie Howlett and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of International Relations at the London School of Economics. Although I'm not going to be presenting my dissertation research today, I am going to be talking about a project that relates directly to Ukraine's independence. As you can see in the presentation, it is entitled, How Did Ukrainian Youth Engage with the Euromaidan? Understanding the Role of Young People in Ukraine's Nation Building. So the reason that I came up with this topic is because youth and those under the age of 18 are typically understudied within the social sciences. One reason for this is that youth or minors are not typically considered to be full citizens with voting rights. Moreover, surveys and interviews, which are typically used to study public opinions and attitudes, encounter ethical challenges and considerations when accessing and interacting directly with minors. Although young people have limited understanding of geography and politics, the avoidance of this age group has in many ways implied that the impacts of politics are minuscule or less important than those of, as adults. Of the research that has been conducted on youth, studies have predominantly focused on older adolescents and usually those located in Western countries, specifically the United Kingdom, the United States and Australia. In Europe alone, those living in the former Soviet Union and even more specifically Ukraine have been greatly under-researched especially those younger than high school age or under the age of 18. Previous studies have also focused on young people living in major cities who are undoubtedly the easiest to access, but this has meant that less attention has been devoted to those living away from the center areas in more rural settings and on the territorial peripheries of post-Soviet states. But as a person's identity and worldview are very much shaped by the physical place where they reside, uh, individuals living near states' borders are undoubtedly unique from those living in central areas. It is therefore important to also consider these people and youth more generally in studies of politics as these previous studies have uh, uh, failed to do so. So in order to do so, as you can see, this project asks the following questions. How do youth absorb national sentiments and narratives when they live across the country from social and political events like protests and demonstrations? And can such messages shape their conceptualizations of their state and nation, and in turn, their sense of national belonging? So in order to answer these questions, um, my study is based on an analysis of 45 randomly selected short essays and poems written by pupils between the ages of nine and 17 from three of Ukraine's regions. Zakarpatya, Volin, and Chernihiv. The essays and poems used in this project were submitted during an international literary and artistic competition called Jitya Tobi, which took place from October 25th, 2014 to February 25th, 2015. The contest was a collaborative project between the International Institute for Education, Culture, and Connections with the Diaspora and the NGO Maidan Norway. So the aim of this contest was to uncover children's thoughts about their lives immediately following the events of 2013-2014 by instructing them to creatively depict the main theme of the comp competition, what life is to them, through any media of choice. More than 7,000 works were received from approximately 1,500 participants. So as you can see in the map, Ukraine is bordered by seven different states. So therefore, these three regions were strategically selected because they each border at least two different external countries and they are unique from each other economically, culturally, and socially. In addition, the capital Kiev uh, is not located in either of these regions, as you can see where this star is. And this was actually where the primary protests and violence of the Euromaidan took place. These regions are all closer in proximity to the countries that they neighbor uh, than they are to Kiev. An exception here, as you can see, is some parts of Chernihiv. Um, as the people living in the regions under analysis are considerable distance away from uh, Kiev and thus the Maidan or Independence Square where the protests took place, uh, the youth surveyed in the study were most likely physically removed from the events of 2013-2014.
So when looking at these texts, I have looked at them by themes and in social science, we call them codes to analyze some of the messages that were hidden within. I will now show you the three, three different uh, regions and some of the reoccurring themes that arose. So first we'll look at Zakarpata. So in line with friend findings from previous studies, the analysis in Zakarpati revealed that politics do matter. And in fact, it very much influenced uh, pre-adult experiences and worldviews. So while only one author in Zakarpati explicitly mentioned the Euromaidan and another used the more colloquial name, Revolution of Dignity, the majority of young people in some way alluded to the movement's aims and underlying messages. Many made mention of the desire both theirs and the protesters for increased European integration, declared aspirations for justice from the government, and emphasized that Ukraine is European Union too. Despite not physically being present, or at least not likely physically being present, several authors still described subtle and not so subtle scenes from the Maidan and subsequent conflict in Eastern Ukraine, including quotes such as, quote, there was agitation in the crowd as thousands of people stood out in the cold with smiles on their faces, creating a solid symbolic front. And another quote, my brother is a soldier, or our soldiers are fighting back, artillery fires everywhere, everything is covered in smoke, people are screaming, there are many wounded, death is lurking everywhere. Also noteworthy is that when talking about their lives, several authors from Zakopatia also referenced symbols of Ukrainian nationalism, including Cossacks, historical figures like Tarasovchenko and Ivan Franko, and the Ukrainian flag and anthem, as well as the colors blue and yellow, which are Ukraine's flag colors, and the Heavenly Hundred, or the first 100 protesters who were killed during the revolution, also known as the Nebesna Sotnya. The sentiments and expressions found within the Volin youth text very much resembled those from Zakopatia. Explicit references were again made to the Revolution of Dignity and the Euromaidan, however, more in Bolin than in Zakopatia, with four and one mentions, respectively. The authors also conveyed the same pro-European sentiments found in the text in Zakopatia, such as Europe, Ukraine is Europe, and his desire for Ukraine to be a recognized European country with a developed economy. Similar sentiments were also made in reference to violence and conflicts that occurred on the Maidan, as well as the conflict in Eastern Ukraine. And in fact, more references were made to the war in Eastern Ukraine, although the sentiments made in Bolin were quite mixed, both between sad and supportive for the war. Yet as can be seen in this quote on the screen, some, some of the quotes were very detailed and described the scenes very vi vividly, suggesting that the authors geocognitively place themselves amongst the conflict and amongst those protesting or fighting for Ukraine. Similar to Zakarpatia, when discussing their lives, the youth in Bolin again reference symbols of the Ukrainian nation, like the Ukrainian flag, national symbols like the Kozaks, Shevchenko and Ukrainka, and the colors blue and yellow, as well as also the Heavenly Hundred or the Nebesta Sotya. And finally, just as with Zakopat and Bolin, the sentiments expressed in Cherniev were very much the same as those referenced in the other two regions. Again, they were made in reference to the Euromaidan, um, such as uh, the words Europe or European, which arose 27 times in the 15 texts in the context of European values, European future, and European country. While well, only one author directly cited the Revolution of Dignity and none uh, referenced the Euromaidan, scenes from the protests were again prominent in the Trinity of Texts through their description of how, quote, proactive young people, students took to the streets of the capital to show their disapproval of Ukraine's chosen course and, quote, to protest against disorder and justice uh, taking over the country. Also similar to the other regions, were the vivid scenes of violence on the Maidan and in Eastern Ukraine, with the young people again geocognitively placing themselves amidst the events. While the desire to defend and fight for Ukraine arose as a prominent theme in Chernihiv, it actually took a new form compared to the other two regions. Whereas young people in Zakarpatia and Volin used the Kozaks or the Heavenly Hundred as a trope for the national heroes and defenders, those in Chernihiv 
place more emphasis on nature and specifically birds like the falcon, which is believed to symbolize maturity, strength, and bravery. Youth from this region also place more emphasis on their family. Several more descriptions of the youth's mothers crying and waiting for their sons to return from war, or even mentions of other families going off to war were found in the text from this region, and actually more so than in the other two, as I mentioned. Again, and similar to the, two, the other two regions, symbols of the Ukrainian nation could again be found in Chernihiv. Those, um, of those, there were fewer references made to the flag um, and, and the historical figures, as well as less emphasis was placed on the Kazakhs and this heavenly hundred than what was found in either Zakarpatia and Volin. So it must be noted that there were common themes, as I did kind of briefly mention, across all submissions. So of the, note, the most uh, noteworthy examples, um, obviously those of the heroic fighters, such as the Kazakhs and the Heavenly Hundred. As a prominent theme in Ukrainian literature and folklore, it is relatively unsurprising that several authors mention the Kazakhs, as the youth likely learn about these figures in school and or exposed to them in other ways, even if unconsciously. It is interesting, however, that many youth also constructed and even conflated the Kozaks with the Heavenly Hundred, as this latter group would not hold any significance if not for the Euromaidan. Words such as noble, trustworthy, and leader were frequently used to describe both the Kozaks and the, the 100 courageous individuals or heroes who sacrificed their lives on the Maidan. Interestingly, the youth did not extend this link to other groups who might also resemble the Kazakhs, such as Ukrainian soldiers, or people who were similar to the Heavenly Hundred, hundred like early, other early peaceful protesters. The Ukrainian adage, glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes, was also referenced in all regions when referring to both the Kazakhs and the Heavenly Hundred. While the youth were not alone in reconstructing the historical freedom-fighting narrative in modern times, as this was quite popular amongst uh, protesters on the Maidan. The fact that 28 references to the Heavenly Hundred were made in the 45 texts, which translates to an appearance of approximately 62% of the pieces, suggests that young people understand the significance and importance of this symbol and this quote uh, or adage for their nation, and they are similarly reproducing it within their writing. Nature was also used symbolically in all of the texts to express the children's desire for Ukraine's peace and to connect time and space. Clear examples are the use of cranberries and birds such as cranes and doves to symbolize strength and coming home. Other examples include descriptors like Ukraine's mighty mountains, golden fields, endless steppes, magical forests, bustling rivers, crystal clear rivers, and boundless seas. Similar illustrations were recurrent in themes or in texts from all regions, and even those uh, without such explicit appeals still implicitly pointed to the tranquility, peace, and strength that the youth long for in Ukraine, especially when juxtaposed against the violence they describe on the Maidan as well as in Eastern Ukraine. So I'll bite under the age of 18, and living quite far away from the Euromaidan protests and the war zone. The youth that I surveyed in my study demonstrate that they are very much capable of expressing candid and real-time commentary on political events in which they did not actively participate, yet they appear to also know a great deal. While not every author mentioned the Revolution of Dignity or the Euromaidan, some instead wrote stories and poems about their lives, particularly two authors in Chernihiv. The rest, though, implied that they understood the importance of their nation and for fighting for their nation, uh, regardless of their age. This also suggests that they are greatly affected by trauma. As, as you can see before, there were some very sig significantly um, heavy traumatic events that the youth had internalized. But in addition to age, my analysis also reveals that distance and geographic location did not prevent uh, the youth from experiencing politics and socio-political events. Quite surprising, only five of the 45 authors mentioned their home region. This was two in Chernihiv, one in Zakarpate, and two in Bulin, and only one child referred to their general direction of their country in stating, I live in the west of Ukraine. 
Further, no authors reference the countries neighboring their region or even external states at all, aside from Russia and a general category as the West. As these findings suggest, the author's distance and age uh, from the, both the conflict and uh, the Maidan did not appear to have a significant and even any bearing on how they responded to and absorbed the events of 2013-2014. So what does this tell us about the future of Ukraine? Well, one is that Ukraine's youth are very much engaged with their nation and their country, even if they are not studied. As the country continues to experience socio-political changes following the collapse of the Soviet Union, clearly these citizens need to be recognized going forward as they are absorbing these narratives, which they will then take forward as they become the new leaders of the country.